Okay, uh, welcome to the virtual future stage at FutureFest 2018. My name is Kate Devlin, and today I'm joined by Dr. Julia Shaw. Virtual futures first occurred at the University of Warwick during the mid 90s, and it arose at a tipping point in the technological development of first world cultures. It cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. And discussions like this helped to complete the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So let's begin. Julia is a psychological scientist and she specializes in memory and criminal psychology. And she has her book, The Memory Illusion, which is an international bestseller and has been translated into 18 languages. And she's also working on a new book that will be out next year. But I also want to talk to her a bit about Spot. And Spot is a bot. And Spot is a bot that is used therapeutically, in a way, um, in order to report um, sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so Spot is an AI that essentially conducts the perfect memory interview every time. So to link it with my memory science, um, I, as a scientist, I've studied how we misremember important emotional events and how easy it is, especially through bad interviews, to essentially add pieces or to forget pieces that are really important later on when you're turning your memory into evidence. Um, Spot helps employees record and report workplace harassment and discrimination. It's not just for sexual harassment. We're actually specifically trying to broaden the conversation um, because I think there's too much focus on this sort of issue. This is a woman's issue, which I think is really quite divisive. Um, but so, so Spot, what it does is it's a, it's a chat bot that you go to at talktospot.com. It's free. You can go there. It's totally anonymous. We don't keep your data. It's yours and only yours. Um, and what it does is it walks you through an interview called the cognitive interview, which is best practices in memory interviewing, and which is actually the same technique that I train the police and military on to do their job in the best possible way. And so it starts with open-ended questions, follows up with probes, sort of tell me everything you can remember, and then it asks you, you know, you mentioned this where the AI piece comes in. You mentioned your boss. Can you tell me more about that? At the end, it walks you through everything, and then it says, okay, now would you like to keep a PDF record for yourself? And this is, I think, the really crucial bit, is what it's doing is it's encouraging you to create a contemporaneous, time-stamped PDF record that you could hold in someone's face, or digitally hold in someone's face, um, and say, hey, look, this is what I remembered at the time. It's not my brain's version three months later, two weeks later, two days later. It's the version at the time, asked in the best possible way, extracted and preserved, and I think this is what excites me, outsourced. I think at this point, I've come across absolutely nothing in neuroscience or in memory science in general that says, here's how to preserve a memory perfectly in your brain. And so this is why I've moved towards AI. Um, and given that there's so many people who want to talk about harassment and discrimination right now, we help them preserve that experience, that emotional experience. And then we also allow, after this, if you want, the ability for you to submit a report. And you can submit this PDF record anonymously to your employer as well. So it's, it's really trying to ease the process, make the best possible evidence, share that with someone, and then also give companies the ability to take action. Well, there's so many nice things about this, this use of AI. And it, it goes way back to sort of 1966 when Joseph Weizenbaum came up with the Eliza bot. Mm -hmm. And Eliza was really interesting because he, he kind of made it as a parody, but you find out that people get really, really attached to it. Oh, it's amazing. So people, uh, like with lots of bots, they tell Spot that they love Spot. Um, they, they'll tell us as well because we ask for feedback. They'll tell us that this was sort of a really in intense, emotional, cathartic experience. Even though, to be honest, we designed Spot to be very proud practical and neutral. It's specifically not an Eliza bot, yeah. but the same principles of sort of oversharing can apply. We've had people use it for like four or five hours, wow. even though it's just a really straightforward interview. There's, a, there's, that, there's that need for people to assume that level of intelligence, even when it's not really there. It, it draws them in, doesn't it? And I, I think it's, it's not just that, but I think it's that sometimes we, we sort of assume that you need, quote, a human connection that you need an empathetic person looking at you, sitting across from you, nodding. I don't think that's true. And that's what Eliza showed as well, right at yeah. the beginning, is you don't need the human connection. People like to just talk. They want someone who can listen. They want someone who will respond, sure, but, or that, rather than who. Um, but they don't necessarily need um, the level of emotional connection that we might assume people need for a good interaction. Yeah. And we see it with, we see it with a lot of the voice assistants today as well. We see people getting quite engaged in conversation with those. I think it's, it's fascinating. So um, your book, The Memory Illusion, 
Um, the subtitle is Remembering, Forgetting, and the Science of False Memory. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so in The Memory Illusion, I explore all the different ways in which your brain makes up memories. Um, so from little details, so if you close your eyes now and you try to remember all the details of this moment of this room, you're going to forget most of or not remember most of what just happened around you, and that was a second ago. Um, and you're going to misremember things. You might misremember the color of my shirt or the color of the stage. And that's as good as your memory's ever going to get. So from perceptual flaws, from immediate storing problems, all the way up to my research, which in involves in encouraging people or getting people to misremember committing crimes that never happened. Uh, our brain has this exceptional ability to be creative and fluid and to connect pieces of our brains, of memories, of little bits of, of things that we've experienced, of colors, of emotions, of places we've been, people we know, and to connect these in a way that never actually happened. Um, and so that's where, in an extreme case, we can get to false confessions and eyewitness testimony that's faulty. And in everyday situations, we just sort of go, oh, you know, that, that's how it is. I just don't remember that very well. So how easy is it to convince someone they've, com they've com committed a crime that they haven't actually committed? Yeah, so there's, there was a lot of research before mine that showed that we could, for example, convince um, normal, healthy people that they've um, been in hot air balloon rides that they never took, that they nearly drowned, that they got attacked by a vicious animal, that they, uh, there's just so many, that they met Bugs Bunny at Disneyland. That's a good one. Why is that impossible? I'm going to guess because it's not a Disney character. <laughs> um, so there's, there's lots of impossible and implausible memories that researchers have, researchers have implanted. Another one is having tea with Prince Charles. Wow, people, people convince themselves. Children in this case. Oh, um, wow. But yeah, researchers convince children. Um, and then mine was just taking it to the next level of showing that um, you could not only come to believe that you saw other people do things that didn't happen or that you experienced just general emotional events, but actually that you falsely confess in vivid detail to a crime that never happened. And in my study, 70% of the participants came to accept this reality. And when I showed the videos of these people, these participants, recalling the false memories of committing crime, other participants couldn't tell the difference between this person recalling a true memory and this person recalling a false memory. So both the participants and the people looking at participants recalling these memories couldn't tell the difference between a true memory and a false memory. So I think that's, in some ways, that's the take home message of the book is that it shows you all the different ways that you need to be conscious and aware of how your memories can be influenced and are influenced. And only then can you start to be cautious about that and maybe avoid some of those pitfalls and ultimately, maybe, uh, and this is why I've landed in AI, uh, maybe realize that your brain is, in, is just not going to be able to store certain things. You need to outsource it. You need to write it down. You need to put it somewhere else and say, here, hold this memory. I might need it later, because your brain's not good at it. So it's a, bit, it's a form of extended cognition, really. We're relying on something else to record those memories and to be our brains for us. It is. It's, I, I think it's the, the next cognitive revolution. So the, the first cognitive revolution in the world of psychology happened in the 1950s, which was an intersectional study of the mind, essentially, um, using actually early models of computer science and other things, um, but looking at the thought processes themselves rather than the behaviors that that result from the things that we think. So before then, there was this huge era of behaviorism, just looking at how people behave, thinking the brain is this black box, don't bother looking in it. Uh, the co first cognitive revolution said, no, no, the, the thoughts themselves are actually really important. Let's try to understand those. Now, it's not just let's try to understand those, it's try, let's try to replicate those and extend those and outsource them. So I think we're really seeing a shift in how research even is approaching this um, and moving more to yeah, an extension of the self rather than just understanding the self. And I'm going to ask the question that I always hate getting asked, where do you think this will go in the future? Are we going to see direct brain interfacing? Are we going to see that kind of stuff? <laughs> I think that the near future, I, I can't picture a near future without something like Spot, without bots and other tools that help us by interviewing us appropriately and getting our memories out through that. So you don't need to go right into the brain. You can just talk to people, you can just get people to share their experiences by typing or, or putting things into a computer. Um, but beyond that, I think it's, it is quite difficult to know exactly where we're going. I think there's a desire to go to direct neural interfaces where you've got implants or you've got um, neuroimaging that's recording something that's happened um, and preserving it. But I think we are so far from that right now. And Elon is uh, hopeful and wishful in thinking that we can just download the brain. But right now, there's really nothing to suggest that we're going to be able to do that. I mean, I'd hate to say Elon is misguided, but Elon is misguided. 
Yeah. Um, I'm so going to get lots that. of Twitter trolls because I said this. <laughs> so, no. No, no, it's a controversial subject. So this the cognitive um, interview technique. So this is the same technique you've been using with the in the memory illusion. You've been talking about that. You say um, so. How, so that, that fits quite nicely onto the spot thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you're kind of. It's almost flipping it in a way. Instead of trying to create the memories, you're trying to eke out what you can. So how does that work in principle? When, you're, when you, people are, say, um, talking to the police, how does that interview format work? So the cognitive interview is... Uh, what it's trying to do is it's trying to be a neutral interview. And it's formed on the, the basis that you don't want to ask leading questions. You don't want to imply that someone might remember something that you're not sure they actually remember. So do you remember a red shirt, don't you? We see this on TV all the time, uh, on TV all the time, that the people just ask these horrendous questions that would never be appropriate. Um, and hopefully real police officers don't ask very often, although we do see transcripts where they ask very leading questions sometimes. Um, or lineups where they say, that's the guy, right? Um, of course, horribly leading. And the problem is that these kinds of interview processes can actually get you to replace your memories. And this is, I think, particularly fascinating. So, I almost want to take it back one step okay. to reality. So I think what really fascinates me about memory and identity and false memories and how that all fits together is that we're creating our reality with how we remember things. And my research and research like mine shows that other people and you yourself can manipulate your sense of reality and your sense of who you think you are relatively easily. And so in a police interview, if a police officer points at a face and says, that's the guy who did it, right? You might go, yes, because it's a social situation. You want to do well. You think that police officer probably knows more than you do. Uh, and if you're not so sure, you might just go, yeah, 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 that's, that's the guy or, or the woman. Um, and the problem is at this point, your memory of the original face, as you might remember it as, say, a victim, is replaced by the photo, by the face that you've just seen. You no longer have access to the original version. It's startling. Like it's, it, we, we don't have different, you can't go back up and sort of look into the cloud and say, what was version you know, 14? Um, it actually physically replaces that memory. Um, and so the cognitive interview gets around that by saying, tell me everything you can remember, having a free recall phase first, and then asking follow-up questions based only on information you've provided and asking you to elaborate on it. Um, and then it follows up with things like specifics, like when exactly did this happen? What, how did you feel during the event potentially? Or were there witnesses involved? So very practical interview. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the, biggest, the biggest thing. And how, how, do people, how do people react when you tell them that their memory is false? What's the kind of... <laughs> it's mixed. Uh, some people say, thank God, I thought it was just me uh, <laughs> and that my memories are, are going because I'm getting older, for example. Um, I feel like my memories are, are getting worse as I age. Uh, other people say, essentially, uh, you're wrong. Um, and this is another amazing part about our brains is that we are always our favorite expert. And so if I tell you that you didn't do something, you might say, no, but I remember it so clearly. And so we see this in real world false memory cases quite regularly, where someone remembers something that we know objectively cannot be true. And yet that person says, no, no, I remember it in such vivid detail, it must be true. My reality eclipses any potential for you to come in and say, this is the, the quote, actual reality. My personal reality is the only one that matters. Um, so there's so. been lots of, um, I think this, when it first emerged, it was about sort of false memories of abuse and things like that. So that's been quite a controversial area for this. Is that where it all sort of kicked off, the, the field? So false memory research kicked off before um, it came around the, the attention of satanic uh, child sexual abuse and the satanic panic of the 1990s. Um, we still occasionally hear it mentioned in accordance with historic child sexual abuse claims, and I actually occasionally work on these kinds of cases. There the question is, how can we be sure that someone coming up let's say 20, 30, 40, 50 years after something happened, and for the first time disclosing abuse, for example, how can we be sure this memory is accurate? And the answer is, we can't. But we can look for red flags and how that memory was, was brought forward. So we can look at the process of the interview. We can look at what kind of therapy potentially was used. We can look at whether this person disclosed it to somebody else. Um, so we, we can look at whether this memory is possible. So if someone's claiming they remember something when they were one month old, that's an impossible memory. 
And so we can look at these kinds of things, but ultimately the key isn't looking back because that's incredibly difficult. The key is to preventatively use the right techniques and to understand how slippery and fragile our memories are and to prevent these mistakes in the first place. I just want to finish off by asking you, if you could recall everything in absolute perfect detail, would you want that? Absolutely not. <laughs> so our brains are actually uh, intentionally flexible. So false memories sound like a problem. They sound like something that our brains shouldn't be doing. But in fact, if you look at how the brain creates false memories, it's very similar to things like creativity and emotion and, and uh, problem solving. So the flexibility of the brain, the ability to reconnect pieces in the brain, bits of memories that weren't originally together, which is the same foundation of false memories. That process is absolutely critical to being human. And I think that also from people who do remember most of their lives, from highly superior autobiographical memory individuals, they generally say that they're really unhappy. Um, and so it looks like we're, our brains are optimized for navigating the present and, and problem solving for the future, not so much perfectly recalling our past. Thank you. I want to end with this reminder for those interested in the future. Some things that may seem imminent or inevitable may never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not contingent on our capacity for prediction. Although sometimes, on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable comes of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that here. So please join me in thanking the incredible Julia Shaw.